Hello, hello. It's a pleasure to lead this Bible study with you again. We're looking at question 105. Question 105 of the Westminster Larger Catechism. That has to do with the first commandment. We're looking today, we'll continue looking today at the sins forbidden in the first commandment. Let us remember the first commandment, which states that those who worship God ought not to have other gods before him. The, in the short, the, the, the straightforward commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We have already looked at the principles of interpretation of the Ten Commandments. We have several principles. We have looked at the introduction to the Ten Commandments. We have looked at the duties, the positive aspect of the First Commandment. And we, have, and we are now looking at, we will continue looking at, the sins forbidden, meaning the negative aspect of the first commandment. So today we will continue from where we stopped on the previous study. On the previous study, we were talking about idolatry and the atheism. Idolatry, let us remember, is the sin of disbelieving, disbelieving in God or to act or live as if God did not exist. That is atheism. The, the word itself, uh, a, meaning it's a, that prefix is placed there to indicate the opposition, the contrary. Theism is the belief in a God. So, a theism meaning the non belief in a God. That can be practical. The, the person may live as if God did not exist and not give it a thought. The person may have no opinion whatsoever about God or the existence of God. The person cares absolutely not and that the person's lifestyle is is as if God did not exist. The theoretical atheism is one that the person thinks through the topic and the person comes to his or her own conclusion that God does not exist. Uh, that is a theoretical atheism and some, some, not all, some theoretical atheists, they go into what we call today militant atheism. Militant atheism is the conscious effort. It is a, a, a militant atheist is a person that will employ a conscious effort to draw other people into the atheism lifestyle or belief. Now, idolatry, of course, this is all condemned on the first commandment. Idolatry is to simply put something in the place of God. Idolatry uh, can be to, directly speaking, it's to the making of an image that is, is the physical representation of God, which of, of course we're going to deal with that mostly on the second commandment. But idolatry here is to, once again, we're going to deal with that on the second, second commandment, but now we're just going to briefly touch it. And idolatry is to put something or someone in the place of God. It can be a wonderful thing, it can be a bad thing. You may put family, which is a wonderful thing, in the place of God. You can put marriage, which is a wonderful thing, in the place of God. Or you can put straightforward other so-called deities. You may say, I, I shall not go, I'm not going to worship the one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Instead of that, I'm going to worship Allah that is condemned by the scripture. The scripture reveals God in three persons. One God, one God. It's a, thoroughly, it's a through and through monotheistic religion, that's Christianity, displaying God and not displaying, teaching God, the Christianity teaches and reveals God to be three persons in one. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, but, for example, in the Jewish religion, uh, in Judaism or in Islam, God is not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's, it's a one deity in one person. Christianity disagrees with that from, from beginning to the end. So, that, the first commandment condemns any to, to the worship of any, anyone or anything or any being that is not the God of the Bible, that is not the triune God of the scriptures. So that is idolatry. 
Now we're going to continue on the other com on, on the other sins that are forbidden in this first commandment. Let us pray before we we look into those details. Oh, blessed be your name, Almighty God, for you're good and kind and compassionate. And Lord, you do forgive our sins. You do forgive the sins of your people when they cry out to you in repentance, trusting in the righteousness of Christ to wipe their sins, to remove the sins of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Lord, living a lifestyle that seeks to honor your name, whole, carrying a belief, carrying a promise, carrying a conviction, a heartfelt conviction that their righteousness in, is not in themselves, but is a, a byproduct of their union with Christ. And Lord, we may believe Christians that are truly, truly uh, born again, they may believe in the promise of Christ, when Christ prayed, as registered in the book of John, in the Gospel of John, when Christ prayed to the Father, saying, O oh Lord, may they be one. O oh Father, may they be one with me, as I am one with you. So, Lord, all Christians can trust in the forgiveness of their sins based on their union with the blessed Christ. Therefore, O oh Lord, we do pray, forgive us our sins, and Lord, teach us. Teach us the path of holiness, the path of, of sanctification, so that we may not walk in sin, but in newness, but rather to walk in newness of life, in love for Christ, and rejoicing in the life of sanctification, which is the best of all lives by far. Bless us, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the sins forbidden in the first commandment are atheism, in denying or not having any God, idolatry, in having or worshipping more gods than one, or any with or instead of the true God. So, that's what, what we saw in the last study. Let us continue now, seeing what are the sins forbidden in the first commandment. Let us continue. We are going to look at reference 471 that states, the not having and avouching him for God and our God. For biblical evidence, we shall see Psalm number 81, verse 11. But my people would not heed my voice, and Israel would have none of me. So we see here that the theologians of Westminster properly interpreted the Bible. Uh, Psalm 81, verse 11 speaks of this terrible sin of disregarding God. Look at this. But my people would not heed my voice. They will not have God as their instructor, and Israel would have none of me. Actually, if you see that this have is in italics, the King James and the New King James, which is the translation that we have the pleasure of using on all our studies, when, when the italics appear, that, that is an indication that that word was supplied by the translator, that, wo that word was not found in the original Greek or Hebrew, but the word supplied by the translator for the purposes of making the reading more smooth and more grammatically complete as per the dogmas of the English language. So this italics actually show how honest the translation is. If you read without the italics here, and Israel would none of me. It's, it, sounds even more emphatic. Israel would would none of me. <laughs> of course, the proper supplied verb, it is indeed they have. But, but the point is, Israel doesn't want to have anything to do with me. Israel wants to be away from me as a way can possibly be. Israel and anything of me would not match. That's the state of Israel. Clearly, that's exactly the this, this sin condemned in the first commandment. Not having God for God and not avouching him for God or our God. Avouching, that is avouching and vouching. Vouching is when you, you are giving a personal guarantee upon of somebody else. So, for example, I say, oh, I can vouch for this person. This is an honest person. You can hire this person to your company because I know this person, I can vouch for this person, and I'm sure this person will do a great job. 
that's vouching. A vouching is just a, the openly and, and free declaration of whatever it is that the person is declaring. It's to declare openly and freely something. So that's a vouching. So the sin here is not having God for God or not avouching, not declaring, not affirming that he is the God and our God. So the sin here is to say or to deny or to say that God is not your God or deny that God is your God. Now observe, not the sin here is not only to say that God is not God. The sin is also to say that God is not my God. The denial of the Godship of God, of the God, not Godliness, uh, Godhood, if I can say that, the, to deny that of the one true God is a sin, and to say that that God is not the God that you carry is also a sin. Not caring that that God for your God is a sin, is a sin. Now, you may say, Philippe, how arrogant is that? If the person want to have the God of the Bible for his or her own God, that person has the right. Well, according to the Bible, no. According to the Bible, God presents himself, presents himself as the maker of heaven and earth, as the Lord, as the creator, as the owner of heaven and earth, and all those who live there. The psalm states that God owns the whole earth and those who live in the land. God is not making petitions of men. God makes demands of men. Why? Because he can afford to. Why? Because it's fitting for him to. Remember, Christianity does not display the relationship between God and man as a relationship of equals. In fact, is the relationship between God and man is the most uneven relationship ever. Why? Because it's the only relationship in which a finite being is relating is yeah, relating to an infinite being. The distance between finite and infinite is well infinite. There is no relationship that is as uneven as this one. The relationship you may have with a dog, or with an ant, or with an amoeba is far closer than in terms of, no, no not, I don't want to use the word closer, far more even, far more balanced, far more equals. That is a relationship of, that is not equal, I'm not saying you are equal to an ant, of course not, You, if you are a human being, you are uh, far above, you are made in the image of God, that's that's, that, there is a, a sanctity in your life, in your being, just because you're made in the image of God. But the distance between you and an amoeba is far closer be, than between us and God. An amoeba is finite, you are finite. That's the f nature of the first proposed relationship here. The second one is finite and infinite. So remember that God has the right to say, I must be worshipped as God, and all those who do not worship me as God shall face severe consequences. In fact, it would be wrong of God to not do so, because he made and he has the authority. And in fact, the more God does that, the, the happier we shall become. Why? Well, how one could possibly find greater happiness, greater joy, or greater love, or greater meaning than by relating with the infinite, with the infinite God, which is also personal God. So, if God, who is infinite, who is eternal, have condescended to the point of relating with humans, which are not eternal, which are very quite brief, <laughs> so, so, so finite. If God, the infinite being, have condescended to the point of relation to, to humans, could those humans possibly have any other chance of a greater and more fulfilling and more satisfying or more joyful relationship? So when God demands that that relationship takes place, God is saying, 
this demand is the safeguard for your own happiness. If God were to give you an option, he would be saying, well, here's the option to destroy yourself. Now, here's the thing. God does the option, does give the option. But if you choose that one, you shall be punished. You shall be punished. First, by inherent logic of it. When you choose to be away from the source of all knowledge, of all wisdom, of all blessedness, well, you're not going to have much of wisdom, joy, blessedness, and happiness. So that, that's a punishing itself. And that being who declared that he does not wish for that will be angry. So there is the intrinsic, inescapable dynamics of being away from God. And second, the second part, which is far more dreadful, that God will actually be angry at the human being that chooses to be away from that God. God is not a God that, this, that puts away the person's choice. God is able to change the person's desires, not by doing violence to the person's will, but God is able to overcome the person's resistance and lovingly draw the person. So indeed, we, we see in God the essence of all good, of all love, of freedom even. God, the, God calls you to love him, but God will not do violence against you and force you to love him. But God will help, hold you accountable if you fail to correspond to his loving call. That is the absolute best of the best that any being can possibly do. And that's why God does it. So not having and not avouching God for God or your personal God. Another sin, the omission or neglect of anything due to him required in this commandment. So to not do, to fail to do, or to, be, to neglect a duty that you have towards God, to neglect something that should be given to him, to fail to do what he has commanded, that is a sin. Why? He is the sovereign being. Not doing his will is a sin. By not doing the will of God, you are saying you're not really God. Because you see, if God is God, then his will must be obeyed at all costs. Let me say this again. All costs. All now, if his will is not being kept at all costs, therefore, he is not being treated as a God. That's why not to do his will is a sin against his own deity. It's to say that, no, you're not really God. Because if he is God, then that's how you relate to a God. A, whichever deity... By the way, there is only one, God the Almighty, from the Bible, from the Christian Bible. But the concept of divinity itself is a concept that comes with it, a demand for obedience to that divinity. Otherwise, it may be a great being, but not a divine being. Divinity demands obedience, worship from the subjects of said divinity. It's, it's an inescapable reality. It's not even a matter of, re of religion now. If there is such thing as a divine being, that divine being will demand that. That's it. <laughs> it's, it's the logic of reality. It, it's, <laughs> it's the same as saying, if there is water, that water will be wet. There's no use in arguing against that. It is because it is. So let us see this omission, the sin of omission of not doing or neglecting to do what God has commanded. Isaiah chapter 43 speaks on that. In verses 22 until 24, we see God complaining to the people of Israel. But you have not called upon me, O Jacob. It's just a way of saying Israel. 
the, the nation of Israel. Remembering Jacob is that patriarch that had his name changed to Israel. So God, when God would refer to the whole nation, at times he would say, Oh, Israel of mine, or he would say, Oh, Jacob, meaning the whole nation. But you have not called upon me, O Jacob. They have failed to call upon the Lord. They have failed to pray. They have failed to seek God for their, their needs. That's a sin. And you have been wary of me, O Israel. Another sin. God demands that, he is that, should be, that we treat him with love, honor, respect, and adoration. In Israel, upon hearing God's name, Israel would be like this. Oh. See, they were wary of God. Interesting, some people call themselves Christians. But when it comes Sunday, time to go to church. Suddenly their energy levels are so low. Interesting how we can be so excited for so many things. But when it comes to a prayer meeting, or a Bible study, or a worship service, or a gathering of God's people, or even a church function, you know? All of a sudden there are so many excuses, so many demo demotivation. Oh yeah, I wish I could go, but I have something else, or I'm too tired. It's amazing yeah? how we may call ourselves Christians, but the motivation doesn't look like we are dealing with God, isn't it? You have brought you have not brought me the sheep for your burnt offerings nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. The book of Leviticus, even before Leviticus, but mainly in the book of Leviticus, God described a very complex, not very complex, but detailed, a very detailed, let me put it this way. It's not really complex, but it's very detailed. System of, a sacrificial system to be employed by the Jews of the Old Testament, which no longer is necessary today because Jesus, the Messiah, the one to whom all that system was pointing, came. So the reality came, the shadow is no longer necessary. You don't need, if you see my face, and right now you see my face on the video, you don't need to be thinking about the things that points, that points to me. You know, you know me, you see me. So... You deal with me in a direct fashion. You don't go in an indirect route. So on the, the, old, the old system of sacrifices in the Old Testament, there was simply a system that were designed to teach the people of God about the fact that sin brings death and that death will be brought upon those who sin, that, sin, that death is the wages of sin, is a consequence of sin, that sin begets, that sin brings destruction, and there is the only way to satisfy God's anger is when God punishes severely those who sin. Now comes Christ and he is punished by God himself on behalf of his people. And Christ gladly takes the duty and sadly takes the punishment. When I say sadly, I mean that he did not want the punishment itself. Of course, he was a healthy um, a person with a healthy psyche. So he gladly took our place, but not the pain, obviously. If he, if he would enjoy pain, he would be a disturbed human being. So he was glad to, to be our substitute, but of course not glad at all to be nailed to a cross. And we worship him for that. We worship him for being that healthy human being, that person with a, 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 a great psyche, and our Savior, and our substitute, and the Lord of Lords, and the God above all gods, and the one, the second person of the Trinity that came to the world and became flesh and took flesh upon itself, and lived for us, and died on a cross, that lived as a regular human being, taught as a supernatural teacher, died as a substitutionary uh, representative. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord God, Savior, Jesus Christ. I have not caused you to serve with grain offerings, nor wearied you with incense. You have bought me 
no sweet cane with money, nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. So God is saying, you guys have brought the sin that I command you not to bring, but the sacrifices that I have commanded you to bring, in case you do the sin that I told you not to do, those who have failed. So what I told you to do, you did not do it. What I told you not to do, you did. That is to treat God as less than God. Every time I sin, every time you sin, we are having a, a, a lap, a, a, a moment, a, a moment of atheism. We are having, we are being atheists for that moment. We are acting as if God did not exist. We are dealing with Him as if He were not God Himself. Next, ignorance. That is a sin forbidden. You do not have the right to not know God. You do not have the privilege of saying, I do not need to know God. In fact, the Bible condemns, as we re as we are about to read on Jeremiah 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 22, and Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 and 6. 1 and 6, forgive me. Hosea 4, 1 and 6. On these verses that we're about to read, you'll see that not knowing God to the best of your ability is a sin. Look at this. For my people are foolish, says Jeremiah 4.22. They have not known me. They are silly children and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. God gave us 66 books in his blessed word. Each of these 66 books speak about the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Each of these 66 books reveal the Trinity. Each of the 66 books have a lot to teach you and I about God. So my ignorance at times and your ignorance at times of God is a sin. You have no right to not know him. Now, of course, you shall never know him fully. You will spend eternity getting to know him. And after a trillion multiplied by a trillion multiplied by another trillion years have passed in heaven, you will have not even scratched, scratched the surface of who God is. Well, why? Well, because he's infinite. It would take infinity to know him. So how, when can I know God in his completeness? When can I know everything that there is to know about God? When you get to the other, to the end of infinity. Where does infinity end? Well, it doesn't. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be a finite measure. In heaven, those who worship God, which of course they shall be there, those who are born again shall be in heaven, and in heaven they shall spend Eternity in the most joyful, most exciting task, not task, privilege. They will enjoy the privilege of getting to know God forever. And after a trillion years, even if they work with their perfect minds collectively, even if they, even if they employ, and they shall, employ every fiber of their being to, the, to furthering their knowledge of God, they doesn't matter how much time passes they will they'll still have infinity to go to the promise of heaven is absolutely fantastic it's and you cannot match that promise of joy and happiness think about this after a quadrillion if there is such a word a quad, quad, whatever after a lo whole lot of years, after a long time <laughs> in heaven, you know God way more than day one. But you still not be done. And the more you get to know God in heaven, the more you will want to get to know God in heaven. And the more time passes, the more you want to know Him. And the more you will know Him, 
and you shall never end that task. Is the perpetual state of blessedness and increase in joy. Undescribable is the only word that can describe heaven. Undescribable. Why? Because God is heaven. Jesus is heaven. Wherever you put Jesus in his glory, not in his humiliation, in his glory, you're going to have heaven. If you take Jesus and throw him in hell, hell will become heaven just like that. He will snap a finger and again and again and again, boom, the place became heaven. And heaven without Jesus will gradually become hell. So where Jesus is in his glory, that's heaven. It can be anywhere. It can be anywhere. Of course, there is a physical uh, aspect to heaven. Don't, don't doubt that. And to hell as well. So, ignorance of God is not acceptable. 66 books to teach you, get to know them. It's amazing. A lot of people nowadays, they, they, they seek after prophets and the blessed people. Uh, because they want to receive a new revelation. They want to say, oh, God told me. Oh, oh. God told me who. Now here's the thing that I don't get it. I have been studying this book for a few decades already. More than two. A bit, a bit more than two decades. And the more I study, the more embarrassed I get because apparently I, the more I study, the more I realize that I don't know a thing. And I don't call myself ignorant when it comes to the Bible. You know? I think it's fair to say that my knowledge of the Bible is a bit more than the average Joe out there. And often I, I'm amazed at how little I do know about the Bible. I have so much more to learn about the Bible, so much more. Why would I ever want new revelation? Why? You see, this revelation here, I still did not go through the whole thing yet. No, I have read the whole Bible from cover to cover multiple times. And I shall read another multiple times again. A few dozen times, few, maybe a hundred times by the time I'm, I'm, I'm dead. If I live to be what the statistics show me that I may live to. And even if I live 150 years, today I read a piece of information that said, an article that said that in perfect health, a human being may live up to 120 or even 150 years. Let's say I live 151. If I live 151 years, I don't think I'll be thoroughly done with the Bible. I really don't think so. You see all these books here that are more there, that are more there? If I read them all five times over, plus this 500 times over, I would still not be done. And why on the world would I be searching for new revelation? What God already revealed to me, I'm not managing. Think about this. God gave me, God gave me and you 66 books. And every time you read those books, it feels like you're reading something new. Because, see, in the book of Genesis, I cannot, I have read that entire book over and over and over. I don't know how many dozen times I have read the entire book of Genesis. From cover, from beginning to the end. And recently I finished preaching through the entire book. In every sermon, I discovered something new on each page. Not even one sermon. I preached thinking, okay, now I... This one, I, all that I'm saying right now, I actually knew before I prepared the sermon. No, every single one of them, I learned, so I brought something new. I, I, something new was brought, to, was brought here. Why would I ever want a new revelation? No, if I would have my way, the Bible would be smaller, so that I didn't have so much to go through. 66 books. And some people... They keep on going to prophets and that, that woman that gives the revelation there. Or that guy that says that God speaks through him. 
why why would you ever want more are you, are you really done are you really can you say i am i have mastered i have mastered the entire 66 books now once you do that you have my permission to go ahead and seek new revelation but i don't think you're going to get through 10 percent before you die my opinion Hosea chapter 4 verse 1 and 6 hear the word of the Lord you children of Israel for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land there is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge that's a very important statement God is saying my people are being destroyed because they don't know this because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Hosea is speaking to the priest. Hosea was a, was a uh, prophet of God. And he was charging the priests with sin. He was accusing them of sinning. He was accusing them of not knowing the Bible and not teaching the Bible to the people of God. And God was saying, my people is being destroyed because they lack knowledge. And you, O priest before me, you, religious leaders of the nation, you have failed in teaching my people about me. And you have failed because you yourselves don't even know. You yourselves did not study. You yourselves did not take it to heart. You yourself did not Keep the words inside your heart. Remember Mary, the mother of Jesus? She saw the words, she heard the words of the angel. She saw what Jesus was doing. And the Bible says that she kept that knowledge in her heart. She took it seriously. What a fantastic woman was Mary, the mother of Jesus. May my daughters be like her. May every woman in the planet be like that blessed woman. And may every man in the whole world be, for example, like Joseph. May every man and woman be like Christ, ultimately. May I be like Christ. May you be like Christ. So, Hosea was telling the priests, Hey, priests, my people are going downhill fast. They are being destroyed at uh, alarming speed. And why? Because they have no knowledge of me. They don't know me. Why they don't know me? Because you didn't teach them. If you, are, if you are a religious leader and you're listening to me now, if you are a pastor, if you are a, an elder, if you are a Bible teacher, Sunday school teacher, you cannot afford to fail in teaching your people about God. Dear pastors that hear me, dear leaders that hear me, we have a responsibility before God. When we stand before people and we preach and we share the gospel and we talk about the blessed word of God, that is the moment not to bring your philosophy. That is not the moment to bring your thoughts. That's not the moment to talk about the weather. That's not the moment to talk about your family. That's not the moment to talk about your wife. That's not the moment to talk about food. That's not the moment to talk about vacation. That's not the moment to tell jokes. Now, all the things that I just said, I myself love it. I love soccer. I love food. I love vacation. I love my wife. I love my family. But when we, start, when we come to teach the word of God, we teach the word of God. When you're teaching the word of God, you mind your business which is the word of God. All of you who disturb the word of God by trying to teach that ghastly, God dishonoring, that horrible, that disgrace of a thing called liberation theology, You shall be severely punished by God because you are bringing your politics and you are changing it. You, you, are, you, are, you are just bringing your politics and, and 
covering it up with religious terminology and calling that theology. You're bringing that disgraceful Marxism and you're covering it up with religious words and you're teaching people as if that would be from God, as if that were the word of God. You, people that believe in prosperity theology, you are bringing your greed to the pulpit. Forget not that many that served God with great passion, with great love, they had not a penny in their pockets. Remember Jesus, the perfect sinless Son of God. He himself said, the birds in the sky have nests. They have a home to go to. But the Son of Man, he was talking about himself. The Son of Man doesn't have a place to rest his head. Jesus endured a lot of financial hardships. And he never said. And you keep on bringing this disgraceful prosperity theology. Saying to, putting people's conscience on the gutter. Telling them that if they are sick it's because they have not given enough money to the church. Telling them that if they're not if they're not rich it's because they have no faith and because they have not given enough money to the church. You bring your financial greed to the to the pulpit and you forget that the apostle Paul said that the love of money is the root of all evil. You people that preach misery theology. You people that bring to the pulpit the notion that God wants to see people poor in poverty. That the more the poorer you are, the nearer to God you are. You people that bring a theology that is not theology at all. It's just a race baiting system. You that want to make black people feel bad. You that want to make white people feel bad. You that want to make whoever color of people. White, purple, black, pink, blue. Uh, 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 what, what green people look bad you, you that do that you shall be severely punished by God God that God shall visit you with such punishment that you would make your head spin that's not my opinion that's Jose because you have rejected knowledge That's it. You're rejecting knowledge. You're rejecting this in favor of liberation theology, prosperity theology, misery theology, race baiting philosophy on the pulpit. You have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being a priest, a priest for me. Because you have forgotten the love of God, I, will, I also will forget your children. Quite obvious here. When the leaders, when the religious leaders, when those who were supposed to teach the unadulterated word of the Almighty Christ, when they fail to teach, the future will look dark. I also will forget your children. That's the future. Your, the future for your descendants will look dark dark you priests that did not honor the biblical the biblical paradigm for the family that is supposed to be displayed at the church and you accepted all those women to be pastors you that did that you are guilty of today we having all those transgenders and homosexuals leading churches openly openly I remember that speech when uh, I think it was right when homosexual marriage was made illegal in the US one leader from the feminist movement no, one leader of the homosexual movement said we want to thank the feminist movement without without you without your groundwork 
would, we would have never been here. In the church, the same thing happened. The church started dishonoring God's view for the family, which ought to be mirrored in the church. And they take men away from positions of leadership. And they start putting women there. A role that was never given to them by God. For their sake. That's the most obvious thing that people don't seem to understand. Leadership is the place to be beaten. Leadership is the place to suffer. Leadership is the place where sacrifices are made. And God did not want his daughters there. He wanted his sons there, not his daughters. And we're going to put there the women to be to receive the beating that men were supposed to handle. So they remove the role of protection and leadership from the males. And they give it to the women. And they take away and the protection that they were supposed to receive from men, they are supposed to now give. And the men that were supposed to be protected now are hiding behind them. And do you know what happened? This, this graceful theology entered the church. And now, no wonder divorce is through the roof. No wonder so, so, so many people, children even now, they are saying, oh, I'm not sure for a man or a woman. Now, if you're not sure for a man or a woman, it's very difficult to know if there is anything at all that you, that you know for sure then. And suffering, suffering. I have seen the suicide rates among these people. These people suffer a lot. And these leaders, they want to push that. They want to push more and more to people. The amount of religious leaders that are pushing the LGBTQ blah, 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 alphabet soup agenda is disgraceful and they keep on pushing they keep on pushing and the people keep on suffering and this happens because you have forgotten the law of your God I also will forget your children for as long as we keep on preaching that men should not act like men for as long as we keep on preaching that women should not act like women we will suffer and the children will suffer the most. And divorce will go through the roof. Which woman want to be married to a man that doesn't act like a man? Which man want to be married to a woman that doesn't act like a woman? I don't need another man beside me. I am a man. Oh, we need a man on this also. Here it is. Here he is. I need a woman with me. Why? Because I'm not a woman. And she needs a man with her. Why? Because she's not a man. Oh no, I don't need a man. Oh, I don't need a woman. See, that's a disgrace. Because when God made, God, God thought that man, that man needs a woman. Let me make for him a helper that is suitable for him. That's what God thought. Do you dare think yourself wiser than God? More blessed than God, sharper than God, more aware of the human psyche than God? Did you make men? No, you didn't. The one who made men, he said that it is good for men. It's not good for men to be alone. He said that. So men are no longer men, women are no longer women. The marriage is dysfunction children are going up in the home with two mommies or two daddies or with a mom and a guy or with a dad and a woman and they have no idea who these people are and every i don't know six months is a new guy in the house statistics show that the safest most the safest by far by far place a child can be is inside the home where the father is present that is the, statistically speaking, the, safe, mo, the safest environment of all. And now because men don't want to be men and women don't want to be women. The amount of children ha 
growing out of wedlock is through the roof. And those children see their mummies or their daddies with a new girlfriend or boyfriend every now and then. And that is the place where rape skyrockets. Where, where physical abuse goes through the roof. And then the people that turned away from God turn to their new God called the government. And they say, Daddy government, please save us. And then Daddy government comes around with its predicted stupidity and say this. Oh, Daddy and Mommy, you cannot even discipline your child anymore. If the child misbehaves and you take a flip-flop and right there, on her le on his or her legs, just one or once or twice should would do the job just fine. No, no, you cannot. That's physical abuse. And then the parents are removed from. See, by the way, I grew up with a whole lot of that. <laughs> with a whole lot of that. Here's the result: I'm a decent human being. I'm an excellent citizen. And I adore my mom and my dad. I'm 36 years old, married with four children. Very well married. With fantastic children. And I call my mom and my dad. Just to chat. Just because I feel like. Because talking to them gives me joy. It's pleasant for me to talk to my mom and my dad. Four, three, four, five times a week. Each conversation, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, sometimes two hours. Why? Just because I enjoy them, I like them, I want to talk to them. If they lived here, if they were geographically near me, I would be over there and they would be over here very often. These were mommy and daddy that when I misbehaved, or they told me, oh, come here, you are getting right now. And the belt would fly, man. And the flip-flop, whoo! I got to know the, the bottom part of those flip-flops that my mom and my dad wore just fine. I knew them. I was thoroughly acquainted with them. And tell you more. I think I got away with a lot of it. When I look back and I think all that I did, I should have gotten way more. Like, like they, they, they were way too soft, in my opinion, even. When I look back, I think, my goodness, they were way too soft. Because they knew that I did wrong, and often they did not even, you know, they, they should. My estimation, see, I was the one being beaten. And when I look back, I think they were too soft. And I adore them today. But then comes daddy government and say, no, you cannot do that. That's physical abuse. Of course, there is such a thing as physical abuse. Parents hitting the face of children. Parents, instead of applying a moderate physical discipline, they 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 are just bringing pain and pain and, and hurting the children. Yeah, that that should be handled by the police. Obviously, obviously, obviously. There's no doubt about that. But then, no, the government removes all the all the rights of the parents, as if the children did not belong to the parents, but to the state. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. It all begins in the teaching that are coming from the pulpits. And I don't think it's going to get any better. The other day I read about this female pastor in Canada. Female pastor. In Canada, that she was an atheist. You heard that right. Lady that called herself a pastor, she shouldn't. And that was not shy to confess. She was an atheist. Enough said. Enough said. I'm sorry. There's no, you cannot say anything. Enough said. Next, forgetfulness. And this will be the last one we'll do for today. Forgetfulness. To forget. To forget God. Simply. 
Jeremiah 2, 32. Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. You know these people that are taught the words of God, that they go to, they're taken to church when they're children, the Bible is read to them and for them sometimes. And they hear preaching after preaching after preaching, and one day all of a sudden they say, I don't want to go to church anymore. Boom, they stop coming to church. And they stop praying. And they stop reading the Bible. And they forget God. And they just forget. Oh, that's something I did uh, I did before, but yeah, I, I stopped going. Don't even know why. I know why. Because you forgot God. Simple like that. Let me tell you this. You stopped going to church because you stopped praying long before that. And let me tell you why you stopped praying. Because you stopped reading your Bible long before that. And let me tell you why you stopped reading your Bible. Because you started thinking that God is not that crucial for you. In short, you were forgetting God. So your forgetting God caused you to forget God. That snowball effect, that thing that led to that thing again in a higher degree, which led to that thing again in an even higher degree, you know, that's it. Forgetting God leads us to forget God in an ultimate fashion. Let us stop here. We'll continue. I have a references 475, 76, and 77. I want to do them all together on the next study. We'll continue. Let we'll continue that on the next Sunday. May God bless you. May God keep you. Let us pray. Let us commit this time to the Lord. Blessed be your name, Almighty God. For you teach your people. Oh God, may may we learn. May we learn your path. May we will learn and walk on the paths of righteousness. Deny, running away, O oh Lord, from temptation, facing the devil, denying ourselves, rejecting sin, and drawing closer to Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. God be with you. Bye-bye.